Guten Morgen, meine Freunde. This is your old friend, the Foul Quince, broadcasting to you from beyond the fifth dimension. This is a slightly unusual presentation this week. I hope you find it interesting and it piques your curiosity. It's really my labor of love, being a reminiscence on that one great passion, the one ray of light into the dark mysteries of our lives and those who shape them. The weekly Top 40 program on my local radio charts. It's time to fetch a plate of biscuits, lemon crisps are always good, and a cool beverage because it's the righteous Bojambo. And it's time to talk about the remembrance of things past, the local acts on Brisbane Top 40 Radio in the 1970s. One of my earliest clear memories of anything, let alone music, is of my teenaged aunt taking me on the bus up Creek Road to the Walton's department store at the Macrovat Terminus on Saturday morning and spending that morning listening to the new records in one of the booths there. That was mid, perhaps late 1968. I didn't know much about the music, I knew I liked fast songs better than slow ones and I liked the sound of the voice more than anything the singer had to say, which is still the case. I knew my cousin liked boy singers, preferably good-looking ones, better than girl singers, although this meant nothing to me as I was still immune to the comely charms of Mary Hopkins or Mama Cass, being some years away from those days when the sight of a leather-clad Susie Quattro would make me feel all funny in the tummy, or even later when on seeing Deborah Harry, I basically said to myself, well, that's it, it's heterosexuality for me. I had it on reliable information from my cousin that Paul was the best Beatle and that he came from England and that Elvis and Roy Orbison, whom I both quite liked, were from America and most critically Johnny Farnham was from Australia. The neighbourhood I grew up in was rudimentary to say the least. Mount Gravatt was on the very edge then of the city, beyond the next block down from that department store there lay nothing. We had no sealed road, bought most of our day-to-day supplies from street vendors, and there was no indoor plumbing. The much more affluent suburb of Holland Park lay up the hill, and we could, until 1969, get a tram into the city if needs be. But basically, we were a late 1950s social housing project that the original inhabitants had moved on from, and those who are wont to drift to the outskirts of town drifted there to replace them. But there was music. There was always music playing out of a radio or from a radiogram in someone's front room or from a party. Every kind of music, snatches of songs which would lodge in your brain as phrases and fragments and you'd never work out the whole song they belonged to until years later. But at the heart of it all was the top 40. And at the heart of the top 40 there were local bands that at first struggled to ape the giants from overseas but who, as time went by, evolved and cannibalised each other and learned their lessons and came down to hold their own against the titans. This is their story, for they were the kings of the world. By the end of the 1960s, the Australian music scene was in tenuous shape. Having been quite robust through the 1960s, producing Beatle-like knockoffs, troglodytic proto-punk bands or genuine contenders like the Easy Beats, whose DNA was to permeate Australian rock for 30 years, as well as some enduring pop idols and more disposable ones. The turn of the decade had seen for many of these bands them fold to fatigue, rip-offs or short-term thinking, the loss of novelty, drugs, or in the case of our best teen idol who was on the cusp of transitioning to adult stardom, Normie Rowe, conscription to Vietnam. The musical climate had changed at home as well, The new wave of bands coming through were heavily influenced by the American jam bands or the new prog sounds coming out of the UK, and this fit in well with the emerging festival scene. 
There were the first stirrings of album-oriented acts in an industry where albums were still seen as a big risk. But as our story begins in mid-1970, it does so against the backdrop of one of the most remarkable and ridiculous musical stories you can imagine, and one which had long-lasting ramifications for the industry. The Radio Man. The Radio Man. As narrated by Levi, Ike and the Foul Quince. I am a music industry fat cat. I am rich because I own a radio station. Like, man, I'm a musician. I'm poor because I'm like a smelly hippie. Uh, I am a representative of the Australian Performance Rights Association. I am doing okay financially, but I have a problem with the way radio stations don't pay musicians for playing their music. You will pay us 1% of your total profits for the right to play our members' music on your station. No way, Jose. We play records as a promotional tool to drive sales. We ain't paying nothing. Like, uh-oh. Okay, evil fob dudes. Pay us now or we'll totally harsh your mellow by cutting off the supply of free records to play. And probably do other, like, legal stuff. Harsh your mellow? That's, like, not even a thing for, like, 15 years, man. Shut up, hippie. Hmm. Let me think about that for a moment. Permit me to consult my legal advisors. Go ahead. Make my day. About two minutes after that. Okay, attention all radio stations. We need to do the following. Disc jockeys, stop playing all records published under APRA controlled agreements. You yes, got us. Guys and gals in marketing, stop including banned records in your weekly top 40 listings, no matter how many they sell. Local musicians, don't worry if you're on the band list. If our DJs like your stuff, it'll get played. Like groovy, man. But then... Crikey, wait a minute. If Fob are banning 30% of the acts on the charts, that leaves a huge demand for artists to fill them. Like, I'm an artist, man. Shut up, Hebe, it's time for new blood. And for God's sakes, take a shower. Like, major bummer, man. A&R guys, get me out there and sign me up with anyone who can stand upright, speak Cry reasonable like. English, and look through in a black and white 8x10. Crikey. And make some pop stars. Crikey boss, I'm on it. Oh, look at the size of this bike. And while most of the new talent did end up falling by the wayside, some acts did remarkably well. Melbourne mother of two, Liv Mason, scored two big hits and earned the first ever gold record for a solo Australian female artist for her excellent cover version of Knock Knock Who's There. Mungo Jerry sold 30 million copies of In the Summertime worldwide, but not in Australia where the mixtures spent seven weeks at number one with it. Domesticated hippie Hans Paulson moved out of his comfortable songwriting gig and cracked the top five with Boom Sha La La Lo before he gave music away and joined a cult. Melbourne's Jigsaw scored with a version of Christie's Yellow River reaching the top five, a big hit which they did follow up with a few more hits, but to be quite honest it didn't exactly measure up to the original. So between them, the new acts and the established local bands managed to lodge 18 hits in the end of year top 100, with nine of them in the top 40, with one additional placement from an expatriate Australian, that being Rolf Harris, a big improvement from the 7, 13 and 3 in 1969. Everybody must have known it wouldn't have lasted, but for the time being, the radio band did have an inadvertent benefit. My art, as it turns out, was a barometer for change. As 1971 came around, down came the TV Week pinups of Bobby Sherman and Paul McCartney, and up came larger, glossier posters of bare-chested, sinewy young men with various imaginative arrangements of facial hair, whom she listened to on albums rather than singles and made much louder, longer and more raucous music. Hard rock and prog, which had arrived in Australia at the turn of decade, had begun to cross to the mainstream. The radio band had ended in October 1970, but the local industry still seemed in rude health, with four acts in the end of the year top 10, including the number one and number two. 18 all up in the top 100, and four songs by expats in the top 40, courtesy of Olivia Newton-John, 
and the Bee Gees. 1971 was the year of Daddy Cool. Ross Wilson's band racking up three huge hits. Eagle Rock, which gave Elton John pause to write Crocodile Rock and will still cause young men born 30 years after the record was a hit to drop their trousers on dance floors in a tradition started by students at the Architecture School at Queensland University. And Come Back Again and Hi Honey Ho, which made number 3 and number 16 respectively, which are oldies station staples. Ross Wilson was to go on and play a significant part in Australian music for the next 20 years and we will be hearing from him again. The other Daddy Cool was somewhat less remembered, being a single from a group called Drummond featuring sped up chipmunk voices. It's not only the worst record to make number one in Australia, but possibly the worst record ever anywhere to spend as many as eight weeks on top of any major chart. What is interesting is that Drummond was a band doing triple duty, as Alison Gross, a reliable soft rock group from Adelaide who featured Graham Goebel, soon to be the Little River Band, who were in the process of evolving into Mississippi, who later recruited B. Bertles and Derek Polici. Mississippi later added Axiom lead singer Glenn Shorrock and, while travelling between the first and second gigs of a night, changed their name to the Little River Band while driving through the town of Little River north of Geelong, going on to record possibly the best run of singles ever by an Australian band and the first Australian pressed album to sell over a million copies with Sleeper Catcher. Somehow, amongst all of this, they conquered America. 1971 saw the debut of some significant acts. Sherbert, who launched 20 top 40 hits and two number ones in seven years. Ted Mulry, another reliable hitmaker of the 1970s. Blues wailing bands like Spectrum and Chain. And the Lardy Dars completed a trio of three of Australia's greatest guitarists ever. Daddy Cool's Ross Hannaford, Chain's Phil Manning and Kevin Borich from the Lardy Dars. Rick Jesse's Girl Springfield and a trio of big voiced women trying to follow Liv Mason, future superstar Helen Reddy, local legend Colleen Hewitt, and the tragic Alison Durbin. While the mixtures carried on with a hit streak from 1970, Axiom, Alison Gross, and Flake continued to place hit, not huge hits, but regular placements. Russell Morris, The Masters, Apprentices, and Billy Thorpe bought the local hard rock fraternity and their tame hippie, Bon Scott. Uh huh. flirted with the lower reaches of the charts and Johnny Farnham hit the top 40 four times, but each time two diminishing returns. And it was the first time I heard the slink and swagger of T-Rex, and I had my first ever rock god. 1972, with its long and glorious summer, saw not necessarily less chart action for local acts, but less significant chart action. Only one local record made the end of the year top 10, the jaunty Bob and the Blues for Blackfeather, but 19 made the top 100 and there were three additional overseas productions. There are a number of reasons here, the rise of the festival with the legendary Sunbury Australia Day, Shebang making its debut where Billy Thorpe famously commanded an audience estimated at 60,000 to suck more piss. The shift of the audience from a primarily singles buying market to an album buying one and the still relative scarcity of Australian albums. The dominance of glam and teen idols and the industry's inability to find and promote talent to complete. Sherbet and later Hush, Skyhooks and the ill-starred William Shakespeare did their best for the glam side and the insufferable Jamie Redfern who at 15 was the youngest person ever to have a top 10 hit for the pop idols and the chronic short-term thinking of the industry to grab the cash and run. Even though there were a lot of dross, there were a handful of truly memorable records. The aforementioned Irresistible Bopping the Blues, Billy Thorpe's anthemic Most People I Know Think That I'm Crazy and the underrated Believe It Just Like Me, Kings of the World by Mississippi, Alison McCullum's Funky Superman, two wonderful songs from Russell Morris, the eternally popular Wings of an Eagle and the heartbreaking Live with Friends, Lobby Lloyd's Hard Boogie Liberate Rock, Johnny Farnham smashed it with Don't You Know It's Magic, and Sherbet had two of their best releases, You're a Woman and You've Got the Gun. If things had started to slide in 1972, they got positively grim in 1973. 
In contrast to the great records coming in from overseas, the local offerings were scattered. Very little rock music made the charts at all, just really tepid AOR novelty hits and half-baked teeny pop trash. Two local records made the end of the year top 40 and Amiga 16 made the end of the year 100. There were still good bands on the scenes, Axiom, Mississippi, Spectrum and their alter ego indelible Murticeps, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs. But these were not top 40 bands, they were album oriented or primarily live acts. Johnny Farnham still had a great ear for a good song, Ted Mullery likewise and for those who were prepared to settle. Earnest singer-songwriter Ross Ryan was an acceptable poor man's Cat Stevens. But by early 1974 it was clear that the industry was in a sorry state and it would almost require a miracle to recover.